for joining us today. Just as Gwen mentioned, uh, this presentation will be recorded. My name is Kimo Nichols. Uh, besides being a new member of the Next Steps Committee, I'm a staff member at Hamilton Library at UH Manoa and a student in UH's LIS program. Today, HLA Next Steps presents local history collections in public libraries. We're pleased to welcome four distinguished presenters on this topic, and I will introduce them in a minute. Uh, but first, I just wanted to give you all a heads up about an upcoming Next, Next Steps program. Uh, if you want to mark your calendars now, Saturday, March 25th at 9.30 a.m., we'll see the first in a multi-part series on book challenges in Hawaii entitled Facts in the Stacks. Session one of this series, again scheduled for Saturday, March 25th at 9.30, is entitled Facts in the Stacks, Considering Book Challenges in Hawaii, and will feature a panel discussion on this topic with Hawaii State Librarian Stacey Aldrich, UH Manoa LAS Professor Andrew Wertheimer, and Hawaii Association of School Librarians President and Mokapu Elementary School Librarian Caitlin Ramirez. Uh, excuse me, an announcement and registration link for this upcoming presentation will be sent out after today's program. So now to introduce today's speakers on the topic of local history collections in public libraries. We are pleased to have with us today to provide us with an overview of the local history collections at their respective branches. Ashley Spencer, branch manager at North Kohala Public Library. Debbie Wong Yuen, longtime former librarian, now retired from Pahala Public and School Library. Vicki Bowie, branch manager at Pearl City Public Library. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from Sharice Castillo, branch manager of the Wahiwa Public Library. I have now yacked long enough, so without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our first presenter. Ashley Spencer. Ashley, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley. I'm the branch manager of North Kohala Public Library. Um, I'm currently sitting in our um, archive room. It's our reference stacks and our local history collection. Um, you can kind of see behind me, we've got a bunch of things in binders. Um, that's part of our local history collection, uh, which consists of a lot of newspapers and family histories from people who are prominent in the area. Um, we are really lucky to have a member of our staff who's been here for over 30 years, and she has a lot of knowledge of where the collection came from and how it's been um, sort of curated over the years. So when I was speaking with her, um, we kind of went over things and we learned that a lot of it was really donated. Um, we have been maintaining the newspaper collections um, for as long as we can. Um, a lot of it was um, either people would give them to the library if the library didn't have a subscription. Currently, there is the Kohala Mountain News, which if you have a PO box, like if you receive mail here, you get that. So we do keep um, those from, I think that goes back to the 70s or 80s. Anyway, our newspapers, we have collections of um, the Kohala Midget, which ran from 1909 to 1917-ish. Um, some of our collections are um, digitized and those we have a little bit more of. I think something might have happened to um, some of the physical items, either when the library moved to a new building or just sort of something along the way. Um, then there was no newspaper for a little while that we have collection of. We have another one called Kamaka o Kohala, which ran from 1950 to 75. Imu o Kohala, which then picked up from 75 to 77. The Kamehameha Times, which ran from 77 to 83. And then Kohala Mountain News, which has been going from 1998 until today. So we do have all of those um, in print and we have digitized versions of them. Um, we have a lot of family photos, family histories from um, people who donated them to the library. Um, if they typed up, you know, the, the Hind family who were a big part of the sugar plantations, um, that kind of thing, people donated, we keep them. Most of what we have has been digitized. Really, it was just scanned in 
or photocopied. Um, and people are able to access the photocopies. For things like the Kohala Midget, we don't allow them to access the actual physical materials anymore. They're accessing photocopies um, because the original papers are just so fragile. We don't want them really handling that and touching those. Um, we have information from events that were important to the town. Things like the Kamehameha statue restoration, the Kohala reunions, stuff that is happening in the town that um, brings everybody together and that is important to the town history. And again, a lot of that is donated. We try to keep track of who's in photos and have photo albums put together um, so that they're easy for the public to access. And this collection is really quite heavily utilized by the community. We have a lot of people who are interested in the history of Kohala or they have people, um, their family was from here and they're interested in learning about their family roots. So to have things be accessible to the public and easy for them to navigate is really important for this collection. Um, we also have oral histories that were done by the local school, the students, will put together oral histories on people in the community. Um, and then when they're finished with that, they donate that to the library as well. And those are all in this local history collection here that we've got. I think that covered everything that I wanted to talk about. So if you have any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Ashley? Ashley, that was awesome. Thank you so question. much. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, Ashley, for preserving all that history. Um, what are your methods for um, documenting the accessions and making sure that the donor is okay with um, levels of access? Um, when people are donating things to the library, we make them aware that they that what they're donating is gonna be publicly accessible. If that is not something that they are okay with, then we generally won't accept that donation um, because we do, we are a public library, we're not an archive. Um, so if, if they're not comfortable with that, then we sort of graciously, and I'm sorry, we won't be adding that one to our collection because our collection is publicly accessible by anybody who enters the library. Is there any kind of instru um, legal instrument you have, like a deed of gift? Not that I'm aware of, but I could find out. Highly recommend it. Mahalo. Any more questions for Ashley? Feel free to uh, put questions in the chat as well. Um, okay. I had a question, Ashley, this is Kristen. Um, for those school oral histories, I was interested in that because it's such an opportunity, uh, kind of a win-win situation for schools. Um, are those are those written oral histories or do you have some recordings? And if so, how are those stored? Um, so far, most of what I've been able to find as I've poked around in here is um, written oral histories. So the students do the oral history project and then they type up everything that was recorded in the conversation. And then that written document is what then comes to the library. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you, Ashley. Um, and again, please feel free to enter any questions um, in the chat. Um, why don't we turn things over now to Debbie Wong Yuen of Pahala Public and School Library. Aloha everyone. Um, I am Debbie Wong Yuen from Pahala Public and School Library. Um, when I first started working for the public library system in 1991, um, there was no history collection per se. There were just items that was given to the library and was held in two boxes. Um, about 15 years ago or so, um, 
a community person that she grew up in Pahala. Her dad worked for the sugar plantation, but she had moved away for schooling and lived on Oahu all the rest of her life. But she moved back to be a caregiver for her mother. And she started, she wanted to start doing research on the Ka'u sugar plantation. And there was nothing to be found. So that started her on her mission to go around and talk to people and ask people, hey, do you have pictures? Do you have stories? And lo and behold, people was giving her albums of, of, of pictures willing to share about plantation life and their family life. So that's how the Ka'u History Collection um, was born, by just asking people to give any type, type of materials. It was, it was, there was an article put in the Ka'u calendar, which is our local calendar for the Ka'u district, that if anyone has anything that they would like to give um, or share, please do. So there were people, um, if they lost a family member and if there are photos, they would share it with this one um, woman that started everything, but she, she, would, she just gathered and gave it to the library. She didn't know how to do whatever or anything. Well, years passed and the collection was growing. And in the meantime, um, the library staff was keeping, um, there, there was already this collection of old community newspapers back in, I can't remember the, the year, but it was all in Manila folders. And so when the community, there's a new community um, newspaper, the Ka'u calendar, and the library would get a couple copies. We always made sure to keep a copy for the, for the collection. So we do have a collection of that. Um, staffing changed at Pahala and Na'alehu libraries, and it came down to only me running the library. And so it's hard for me to start organizing things because things were coming in. And we had two gentlemen, bless their hearts, that just donated their time. And they would come every Tuesday, go through the Hawaii Tribune Herald, cut out any kind of articles that pertain to Ka'u, um, and just put it in a manila envelope and put the month and the year. And that's where it still is. Um, since I retired, I told the current branch manager that I would like to come to organize the collection because I mean, bless the, bless the heart of these men that donated their time. But as far as putting it in order, that needs to be done. But it is pretty extensive. We, we did have a couple of years back, um, a worker from the sugar plantation that wanted to date, uh, donate us to, to the library, these volumes of books. And when you read the books, sorry, phone call just came in. When, when you see what the books are, they're just um, workers and it will show their pay. Um, so that was, that was kind of interesting. But um, lo, lo, there's a lot of things that's been coming in and now it's just to organize everything. So there's a lot of materials. There's, if, we, if the Friends of the Ku Library would get donations of books, and if the books pertain anything to Ka'u, they were good enough to give it to the Ka'u History Collection so that we would have um, books pertaining to Ka'u in that collection. So we have things dating back from the sugar plantation. And unfortunately, because of COVID, the two gentlemen that were going in regularly you know, stopped. Um, they've been both talking about starting, starting it up again. But unfortunately, one of the men um, got sick, so he's going through treatments. And he was a real blessing for this Ku history collection. What he liked to do is talk to different community um, people who lived in the community for a long time. And he would do one-on-one -on -one interviews with them. He had a list of his questions and he would interview them and make a DVD. So we have that in the collection. So it's like an oral history that we had in the, have in the collection. Um, he, we, there was just a friend's meeting Tuesday night and he said he wants to start, start that up again and get that rolling again. And as far as preserving, that is the one thing that I would like to do for the collection, uh, digitize everything. Um, so I, I, those are the things that we, that's the next step, right? Nice to organize it so that if someone comes into the library, 
the branch manager knows where to find it. And so right now it's the organization and then after that's preserving of everything. So any suggestions, um, any guidance would be greatly welcomed um, on you know, what, what you folks use. There, there is a history heritage collection, um, actually museum in the Hamakua side. And one day my husband and I stopped over there and she gave me some pointers. So I, at least I have that to um, fall back on as what kind of materials to use. Cause you know, if we don't preserve them things will kind of just start fading away. The old newspapers that we have is getting kind of brittle and everything. What the men were doing when they went in on to volunteer, they were Xeroxing a lot of things so we could have a Xerox copy. But then again, I just attended this workshop through a church association about preserving records. And it's the right kind of paper to Xerox on, which back then we never heard of. So learning all these different techniques to preserve the history, because if we don't preserve it, it's gonna be lost. So if, I'm open for any questions. Questions or suggestions, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. This is uh, Stacy Bisgard. I used to work at the Kealakekua branch, and now I'm at the Kailua Kona branch. Oh, okay. And um, I just wanted to mention, you might talk with the Kona Historical Society, too, um, just because they're, you know, a local organization, and they're also probably working on a small budget. So, <laughs> so they might be a, a good resource just for, you know, the amount of things that you might have. So that was just a thought. Great. Thought Thank for you. you. Just as a local resource. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, our budget is small too with the Friends of the Ku Library gives the Ku History Collection project a budget, a small budget to work on and, and get supplies. So um, we work off of that. And a lot of times what they were doing is just if they went out and got something, just they just donated it because they know the funds was tight. So um, Helen noted in the chat that Past Perfect software was developed at Kona Historical Society. So that's good to know. Thanks, Helen. Um, and, and I was thinking, Debbie, as you were talking, that it sounds like there might be a need for uh, HLA or maybe AHA to do uh, some additional training for folks who have local history collections like this just to give a, yes. a the basic overview of considerations and types of of preservation techniques that one would want to use in these local history collections so yes. we will yes. put that in our uh, to-do list thank you thank you debbie thanks so much the uh, library is lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up, uh, we have from uh, Pearl City Library Branch Manager Vicki Bowie. Vicki, are you? There we go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So um, I'm the Branch Manager at Pearl City Library. When I started in this position, that was back in 2010 or 11. I used to be the children's librarian here from 2008, I believe. When I started in this library, they had a oral history um, project, and it was called um, Pearl City, A Look at the Past. Um, I, I should turn off my background so you can kind of see the book. Hang on. Well, either way, this, um, this book was called um, A Look in the Past, and this was done back in 1992. It was published. And um, back in 1991, they, they did this oral history project through um, a literacy grant. Um, so it was a Title I literacy grant, and it was meant to create a literacy material on local history for the Waipahu Community School for Adults. And it was um, basically headed, uh, the project coordinator was Arlene Ching. She used to be our children's librarian. Later on, she's she retired from the system now, but she used to, um, she used to be the manager at like our AO Public Library and Eva Beach Public Library. Uh, I think she also worked at Hawaii State Library. Um, but she's very interested in local history. So she started this whole oral history project and it, it I have um, a lot of sound recordings. I have 10 of them on cassette 
and I have a video that she she did with I think Leeward Community College, um, which they called a walking tour of Pearl City, um, which I don't know if I can show you a clip of that later, but it's um, it's not that long, but it's maybe about 10 minutes long. So obviously I'm not gonna show it for this presentation, but it's very interesting because it talks about the history of Pearl City. And she's also produced other books based off of this. One is called Manana, A Pathway to Pearl City. And I think there's another book called Mo'olelo o Manana that um, is also based off of the oral histories that she's collected from that original um, Pearl City, A Look at the Past project that she did in 1992. So what I did was um, I had all these things. They, they're all in our collection. They're all um, uh, they're all available to the public. Uh, I had a a file cabinet full of the transcripts from her oral histories, um, some newsletters that are available in there from long time ago that they've collected over the years. We they think at some point they tried to collect newspaper clippings. So there's some old ones, but really it's all of it is available through the Star Bulletin or the Star or the Honolulu Advertiser from the, the microphone that we have. So we didn't really need to collect those. And um, what I did was when I started, because I have all these things on cassette tape and VHS, and also I had a, a real tape from, it's a, a really old real tape from 1969 from the dedication of the library. And it's all sound, it's just a sound recording. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the technology was back then, but it's this really thin real tape. And I, I actually had that digitized um, a few years ago. So I got funding from our friends at Pearl City Library. And I took all the sound recordings and these VHS tapes that I had, and I, I had it digitized into um, a different format. So like, I think it's um, NV, MPEG and um, something else, but I was able to get it digitized. So I actually have it saved. Um, my only big dilemma is I have to transfer this, the data onto a different, because right now it's it's all saved onto this huge terabyte hard drive, which isn't so huge anymore. It's one terabyte now, but um, I don't feel that the, the, the hard drive is going to last much longer. So I have to transfer this data onto another, um, some kind of other medium. Uh, right now, what I did was I saved it onto my computer <laughs> until I can find something else to save it on. But really this technology doesn't last for very long. I, um, I'm not an archivist. I'm just trying to preserve what we have right now because obviously we don't really have the, um, the, the equipment to play cassette tapes anymore or real, these, these thin real tapes or, um, I don't even have a VHS player anymore. So uh, my only concern at that point was to preserve what we had. Uh, the Ulu Ulu Moving Picture Archive. Oh, okay. I can always look into uh, providing this video to them and having it available. It's very, um, very interesting. It, it really literally looks like a, a walking tour, the, the video of the walking tour. Um, and you have Arlene Ching in it and she's, basically narrating it and she's um, she's showing various local um, community spots that were really popular in the Pearl City era and she talks about the history of it. Um, so if I have the opportunity, I could probably show you a clip of that. <laughs> and that's basically my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Vicky, I'm I assuming, a, sorry, go ahead. Um, I think you said that all of your collection is in, uh, is cataloged. So if somebody looks in the HSPLS catalog, they would find that material or is, did I? It's only the books. Okay. So these, the these books, yeah. And the Mo'olelo that I don't have over here, but this, those three books are, are cataloged. Uh, the VHS tape, I don't know if it's in there anymore. It might not be. Um, I, I do made it, I have made it available to people who have asked me about it. Uh, I've even provided copies of it for them. Um, if they buy me a DVD ROM and, um, and I did get permission to do that. 
although I'm not sure where Arlene Ching is more, but I got, because it was produced by LCC, I got permission from them to do, to distribute copies of it if I needed to, which I don't do very often. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to also point out that um, a couple of resources have been posted in the chat. Helen posted the um, uh, Hawaii Museum Association, um, and there's a link posted in the chat. And then Stacy also mentioned the Northeast Document Conservation Center, which also has a lot of resources. So there are actually a lot of resources out there to give you ideas about um, how to handle both tangible materials. And I think uh, there's probably a lot of information about digital preservation too, and what, how, how best to handle those kinds of questions. I'll take a look at those. I am interested in trying to preserve these, um, these, these tapes, because uh, I haven't done anything to them. They're kind of stored. Although I am limited by my buildings, uh, what's going on with my building. I, I, I don't know if I'm able to get the equipment to really um, preserve them the way that it might be recommended. Um, so I'll see what I can do because I really don't want to see them uh, deteriorate any more than they've already done. I'm assuming time will allow at the end, but I'd love to see a couple of minutes of that film. <laughs> Vicki, thank you so much. Um, lastly, uh, from Wahiwa Public Library, we have Sharice Castillo. Sharice, you all set? Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sharice. I'm the branch manager of the Wahiwa Public Library. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about um, what we have um, in, in our collection, um, how it was started, what we do today and why why it's important that we continue this. And then I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about, about our challenge that we're facing. Okay, so this, this is it, no, good. <laughs> this part of it, this is our logo history cabinet. And now I believe this cabinet itself was create, not create, built or created, but was organized by a previous staff member from early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, Wendy Woodstrom, who is the branch manager of the Nilani Public Library. Um, and so she organized this, we'll, we'll take a look inside. So um, just stuffed with, um, with article clipping, similar to what Debbie and um, Ashley was saying, you know, we, we um, clip um, any articles that are related to Wahiba. And as you can see, there is some sort of organization to it, which is, I think, what Wendy did. And then over the years, um, staff had tried to maintain it. Um, and so, for instance, you have a, you know, Wahiba, anything related to Wahiba Botanical Garden, or articles going there. And then um, uh, when they first started doing this, um, they would uh, paste the articles to um, some kind of uh, cardboard, um, sort of like a file folder, and they just like cut it and then laminate it. <laughs> so this is their way of kind of preserving it. Um, what's interesting is that the this organization we have in this cabinet, it, it's it's not, it's a nice structure for us going forward. Um, like. Debbie, Ashley, and Vicky had said, I'm a librarian, I'm not an archivist. And I really regret not taking in a, a, a class on archiving. Um, but um, so this is what we're going off. Um, we found it very interesting and helpful. Um, periodically, we do have patrons or people coming through um, and wanting interesting information. Um, a couple years back, we had this patron and she wanted to know about um, the Wahiwa Cemetery. And I was like, mm, I haven't been in Wahiwa that long, but I'm pretty sure there's no cemetery. Well, it so I combed through the cabinet and it turned out there was a cemetery and that had been re relocated to Milani. So that was very interesting that we could still provide that service um, to patrons. Um, um, another big part of our local history is the yearbooks. Now, our so Wahoo has been has been settled for many years and it has a long history. And so we've got 
yearbooks um, that were donated from uh, our far earliest is like the 1920s up until the 2010s. Um, so this is actually one of our oldest a yearbook that we have, and this is from 1920 something. And as you can, it's actually in really good condition. We don't do anything like again, not an archivist. And so it, it surprisingly has done really well um, and held up. Um, and then the 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 picture on the right, um, this is I believe from the 50s, early 60s, and so a little bit not in in nice condition. It's it's a little bit bigger though than the 1920s. Um, as you can see here, this is from like a 1950s, 1960s, and so some of the older yearbooks um, don't hold up, and we I don't have the knowledge or how to like preserve it or how to make it look nice. Um, so in addition to the cabinets, the yearbooks, we also have these binders that were uh, the annals of the Wahiwa Public Library. This has a lot of like primary resources, um, pictures of what the old library used to look like. It was actually a house, um, a former um, uh, plantation manager's home up the street from Wahiwa. It's actually still, there and it looks in pretty good condition um but this oh, but this building had like a fireplace and everything um it it's being used for the for the doe but it's it's still there um and then we have like um letters from um the previous librarians uh where they were soliciting soliciting um business businesses in the area for monies to help support um, and build the, the current building that I'm in right now. Um, and so again, we have newspaper clippings, but we also have like very interesting letters um, that kind of um, depict uh, the inception of the, of the library. Um, and this letter here is from the 1960s from a previous um, state librarian talking about um, how the library had started in the 1940s and then um, you know uh, wanting to create a, a, a more suitable branch in the 60s. Um, also interesting, it, it, these articles um, give us clues of what the community was like. For instance, um, there were a lot more Art, uh, news, local news, um, newspapers in the area, Central Sun Press, which no longer exists, but they had, you know, very good in articles about Wahiba and about the system. And it talked, so as you can see, this this article on the left talks about how um, the library had, had um, um, switched over to using computers. And then the 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 article in the um, on the Right talks about you know you see a young kid with a card catalog which we don't have today. Um, the other interesting thing about going through these articles is we find out that that the library was very involved in in art show, um, and as you see in the in this slide here. Um, this top picture um, clipping it shows a student from Lelehua High School and her art piece that was showcased in the library. Um, and then on the left, up oh, sorry, right, um, there's a there's a picture of um, an advertisement for a, an art exhibit that um, my predecessor Matt Brown had started when he was here, and in 2013, and he he had developed this. Um, this art exhibition, exhibition exhibition alongside the, the the local high school, and he didn't know that there was actually one. You know that this is something that the library had been doing for many years before, and so it was just a nice ex surprise. Um, I think that's under my yeah. So what I wanted to talk about was um, so we have these. We have this these things, but again, I'm not a librarian. So, so a lot of some things like I, I I know that you know we it'd be better if some of our primary resources like these pictures and these letters were in a better condition, like in a special box. But um, I 
don't know how to so, so put them, um, preserve them. And, I, and um, this is something that um, we have challenges with. Um, how do you re go continue to preserve these um, materials? The other thing too is why do I have such a, a, a large history? And we do have a historical society that has a lot of primary resources, a lot of um, things that talk about like the plantations, World War II and you know, um, the military. And so years before there were talks about creating a like historical museum dedicated to um, the Wahiwa. Um, the historical society is sort of like an impasse right now. They don't know what to do with all the things that they they have um, that was just in someone's garage. <laughs> and the person that was over that were caretaking for these things, she she didn't have a she just she didn't have a um background in archiving. They just recognized that this is very important things that they should hold on to and preserve, but just didn't don't know the how to do it. And they're very they were very possessive so even though they had these things they because they don't know how to preserve it they couldn't really showcase any of it and um it's sort of yeah so so the the historical society on multiple occasions have reached out to me and they want with their idea of of transporting all actually don't know how much stuff they do have just this is them telling me that that they have items that they want to donate and have it at the library since we're sort of like a community hub um but when that time comes you know as a librarian i'm you know don't have that much space and again i don't know how to preserve all of the stuff so i get and i know that there are a lot of ar archive people on this um presentation and you know this is something to think about like how can how can you lend your services to um public libraries or or you know um maybe this is a project that you're willing to take on i know that um members from the wider historical society are open to getting help from people from professionals they just don't know who and so if this is something you're interested in you can reach out to me and I can put you in touch with the Wahoo Historical Society or if you'd want to come and help us that you know give us pointers on how to better preserve our our things that we have now that'd be great as well thank you Sharice that was great thank you so much any questions for Sharice I just wanted to say it's funny to look at that filing cabinet, but um, on, a, on a purely selfish note, that filing cabinet came, was invaluable to me. Like in my class last semester, I wrote a, a kind of a historical overview of Wahiwa Public Library, and it's fascinating the information that is contained in there. And it also makes me miss the Sun Press because the Sun yeah. Press was a great source for a lot of local uh, community news. On yeah. a kind of micro scale. I think Helen had had your hand 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 up. Go ahead. Yeah, Mahalo. Um, I was just wondering how your library or communities would feel about um a larger state entity taking away your collections and consolidating them. That was an effort last year. That's a very interesting question. Um. I, I guess I never considered it as a possibility. It's a very good question. I think there are there there could be some um, issues because because we're so you know we're in the community. How many you know uh, when I refer patrons to go down to the state archives, for example, if there are some things that we don't have, a lot of them are very hesitant to go down to downtown. You know, it's a lot easier to just come to us. Um, the other thing I want to say is that we do get people from the mainland whose families who, who, who were here once before because the military who want to look up their information. Of course, they're going to come to us because we're in Wahiwa um, and we've had people, you know, use our, our yearbooks to find you know, stores or addresses for stuff. Um, I think it would be a little bit harder, I think, for them to make that trip. But I think maybe a bigger effort to digitize everything to make it more accessible might be a, a better medium. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's their um, 
argument is that, well, we're digitizing and everybody can get to it. But I, you know, all of you talked about the, the community knowledge and that's what I'm wondering how much of that would be, I'm concerned that would be lost, you know? Yeah. If and I, I guess can... also, Oh, oh, go ahead, Ashley. I was going to say, if I could piggyback off of Sharice's comment, I would agree with that because in North Kohala, we're really remote. We're very far away from everywhere. We're 45 minutes out of Waimea, which is like our nearest town. So if people are coming to visit, they don't want to be told, oh, now you have to go all the way to Hilo, which is like a two hour drive to the opposite side of the island to find what you want. Um, so there is that sort of like a centralization effort would be nice, but it would become a barrier for some people, um, especially if they think that it's something that kind of like the state archives that that puts, you know, this sort of weird feeling on it as opposed to your local public library where maybe you're a little bit more comfortable. Um, and people do kind of expect in a way us to have these materials, the history of our, our towns and our, our surrounding areas, you know? Um, and if they are coming here to look for local history and we have to tell them, you have to go all the way over there, they might not get that same knowledge that we would have from interacting with the materials regularly, or even just if you have people who have lived in the area for their entire life, you know, they have a lot of history just from living there too, that you won't get if you go to somewhere else necessarily. I guess the other thing I wanted to say too is, you know, what was this find as state property? Because in like the things that are donated, like the um, new um, the yearbooks, they're not cataloged. There's no, they're not in an inventory. So should I leave? And I'm like, you know what? That 1920s yearbook was very interesting. I could take it up, to, you know, hypothetically. So if it, you know, if the state archives their idea was to centralize and take everything, but how do you define what's, you know, do you take everything that's related to the library, that state, state, state owned or anything, anything that we, that's donated? I guess that, that would have to be decided and kind of fleshed out. Yeah, I would think that, um, Libraries would probably want to accession material to make it clear that it is owned by the library, if for no other reason than that it would be covered by insurance. Whereas if it's not accessioned, I don't think you could argue that it was actually something that should be covered by the state's insurance. But wouldn't it be great if the digitizing could be taken on by a larger entity and, and keep those collections local, but provide more access for neighbor islands and such? Yeah, it sounds like there's kind of a need for, if not a centralized physical repository, there's a need for a centralized digital repository that maybe links out to various local history collections um, that people could go to to find these digitized materials. And I'm thinking, um, you know, our, at our library, we don't, at UH Manoa, we don't really have a very good example. We have an institutional repository where we keep things like that. Uh, so you you kind of need that sort of repository, but then you also have to organize it in a way that people can find the material. You have to have sufficient metadata to make it searchable and in, in a meaningful way. So there is a, a certain amount of people hours, whether they are volunteer people hours or paid people hours that have to be um, devoted to a project like that. But it's really important because, you know, especially those materials that um, you were showing that are glued to a, a file folder, you know, that glue is going to come apart someday and those things are just going to crumble. So if nothing <laughs> else, you know, digitization just to, to keep the content. Uh, it's in. laminated too. So, <laughs> yeah. just, you know, that's their idea of preserving, just laminate everything. Yeah. I don't blame them though. Someone just donated a bunch of newspaper clippings from 
the mid 1990s and it was just in a manila folder and I'm like oh no what do I do with this and there's maybe like a hundred different clippings in there so I'm in the process of sort of pulling them apart from each other because they're all folded together into like a wad almost um and I'm just putting them into sheet protectors at the moment and then putting them into a binder and trying to figure out you know the various newspapers that they're a part of um and then sort of have them make their way in here so it's yeah you work with what you have at the time kind of thing and you in a way sort of hope for the best and as new things come along and we learn more try to sort of up your game and retroactively fix what you can You know, it's always a blessing when people from the community want to give to the collection in your community and you accept it graciously. And then when you start looking through it, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, how are you going to preserve this? Uh, you know, it, it's um, but yet it's a blessing to receive it. And so that is the, the biggest, I think, um, hurdle is the pres preservation part, because even at the history collection for Ka'u, um, there are a lot of things that was given donated that that are old and you know sometimes handling it you know you, the oils from your hand can destroy something so it that is a big learning curve is, is the pr preservation and um and then the space for everything uh we're at pahala library when when the collection got downsized um several years ago by the previous branch manager um we were in a sense lucky because what was in the back stacks uh, where no one could get to, we utilized that space to make the co history collection. So we have things that came up outside where people can see that, oh, there's this. Um, so now it's just trying to, like I said, at that time I was the only staff person and I couldn't get into there to organize and set things up. So, um, and, and, you know, bless the hearts of the two volunteer men that was doing it. They would just receive and just put it all on the shelf. So now it's to go through that file cabinet, go through the shelf and organize. But then the key is preserving everything because, you know, before we just used the regular standard um, copy paper. And now hearing that it has to be acid free paper. And if you're going to put it on something, don't put it, don't glue it on or tape it onto a manila folder. So it's this whole new learning curve and preserving so that way down the road when our great grandkids want to find something it's there and and in Ka'u we have that happen a lot that someone that lived here in their their young adult lives they come back to visit and they'll come to the public library and they want to they want to see and or they want to find a particular thing and and it's a blessing to have it there but then if it's not organized or or, or preserved in a you know in a really um, organized way, it, it's hard to find. So as far as it all going into being archived in a separate place, like in Hilo or, or Kona, I mean, Pahala is like in the, the southern end of the big island. So to tell them, oh, you gotta go to Hilo library, or you gotta go to Kailua Kona library, that, that, is, that takes a lot. And if they're, they're there that day or for a few days, that they're not gonna be able to do it. So I think it is important keeping it in your local um, communities branch libraries so that people can, you know, it's easily to, um, accessible for everybody. Yeah, I just want to um, note that Jade put in the chat uh, a notice that the class LIS 619, which is preservation management, is um, being taught in summer of 2023. And Jade, I don't know if you know, but um, is that a class where they actually have to do a practicum and work on work on real live materials? Thank you for mentioning that because the actual being there with real live materials was one of the things that was a barrier for me as a distance learning student. I couldn't take any archive classes because I was here on the big island and I was doing everything online. So um, to have something that HLA could put together to help us learn that um, without requiring travel would be really valuable too, because 
but not everybody can do that, unfortunately, especially when you're working full time, that becomes that becomes a bit of a challenge. Yeah, that's a that's a great suggestion, Ashley. And I'm remembering that um, a few years ago at an HLA conference, uh, Thora Abarka and somebody else who I can't remember did a presentation on a project that they worked on that was like a community uh, archives and digitization where they would actually take the scanner to the community and help people scan their materials and give them advice about how to handle it. So you almost like need a road show, a preservation road show where you could, um, you know, people don't have to travel long distances to get this kind of specialized instruction. So we'll have to think about how we could do that. And Kristen posted in the chat that, um, there was an article in the New York Times about white gloves, and I, I thought of that too, Kristen, when, <laughs> when somebody mentioned white gloves. Um, Jade said that uh, they, in that class, LIS 619, they did practice repairing old HSPLS children's books, which would be certainly be good practice. Um, oh, it was you. It was Helen. Oh, I'm sorry, Helen. <laughs> I couldn't remember that it was you and Thora who uh, were working with the Puna community. So thank you for putting that in the chat. I have a I have a question. I'm just curious about this, and I've wondered about it. I'm at an independent school library, but I've wondered about it even there about yearbooks and about them being uh, uh, privacy issues about like basically forced um, public media <laughs> for. For, you know, you're in a yearbook and now all of a sudden, I mean, I know um, Ashley, like at Thelma Parker, they have yearbooks from Honoka and stuff like, it. like, is that a thing? If you're in public school, then all of your like embarrassing adolescent photos are now public access. Well, they're, they're all in Ancestry.com now. <laughs> you know, Ancestry has gone to all these different libraries and archives and so forth and scanned all these old yearbooks. So, you know, you and I and everybody on this uh, on this session is probably in Ancestry.com in a yearbook. So yeah. you can also opt out of the yearbook, though. So like if you're worried about those privacy things, um, you you don't have to you can still take a yearbook photo. And then it's used for like your school ID or whatever, but it won't be included in the yearbook itself. Um, and I know a lot of, of families where the kids are um, like in CPS care and that kind of a thing, those are the things that they will opt for because they don't want the yearbook photos to, to kind of be there. Um, the schools also do like the media release forms. So we kind of figure like we're buying that for the library um, and if you've agreed to be in the yearbook you've agreed that everybody and their grandma who stops by to look at that yearbook is going to see your photo you know because like if I take that home and I'm like oh look at my family gathering I want to show my embarrassing sixth grade school photo to everybody like you, you can do that so uh, I have a question which is I know all from friends of the library and um most of you are from, well, presenters are from small branches and wondering how realistic it is to, you know, hold a history collection and be able to um, continue to accept material. Um, I mean, digitizing it would really free up space in your branches and um, would you still want to hold on to the physical material? I think that's a great question. I think yes and no. I think it just depends on the the actual material um, that that you know that we think that the that patrons would want to see. Um, yeah, I think it just depends on like I don't know. I, I think it's nice to have some some things here that pe tangible people can can touch and and can can look at. Um, but other things like maybe your book, I don't know. I just, yeah. I think for the collection in Pahala Library, um, knowing the makeup of our com community, um, they would appreciate it being physically here. So if they walk into the library, it's easily accessible. Um, 
oftentimes they will come in and they'll go to the branch manager and say, well, can I see this? And then they'll just sit down, you know, and look through it and get, give it back. So I think it, it is something to, to preserve in the local libraries. I yeah, think space I can definitely become an issue, but I also think in a way as things deteriorate and reach a point where they're not physically usable anymore, as long as you have that digital backup, that might be the point in which you then like sort of graciously concede to nature and throw away the physical item. Because if you can't physically utilize it anymore, if it's so brittle, it falls apart every time you touch it or, you know, but you have that digital copy, then that might be what you do. And then you can free up some space. Um, we're lucky here in North Kohala, we, the building, was created with the room. It's got some space to grow, um, but we're like a lot of the other branches. A lot of things are hanging out in filing cabinets. They're hanging out in cardboard boxes. We've got binders stacked upon binders. Um, and that's definitely something to think about as your local history collection grows, um, is what are the things that people are actually using? And what are the things that you're just keeping because it's nice to have? Because if it's just nice to have that, but no one's using that, then is it really serving its purpose? And maybe those are the things that you can trade out to make room for the newer materials that people are actually gonna be using. Yeah, I think another consideration is that some of the material that these libraries have, like the newspaper clippings are copyrighted material and they cannot be digitized and put on the open web. So, you know, they're really, uh, in a way stuck with either having the physical newspaper clippings there, or if they reformat the, the newspaper clippings, they still would only be viewable at the library. They wouldn't be able to um, you know, post them online like they would with some of the other material. And uh, Brian commented that he worries about, you know, uh, long-term digital preservation. Uh, so, you know, that's definitely an issue that is being grappled with all over everywhere. <laughs> and Kristen appreciated Ashley's quote, graciously concede to nature. So yeah, thank you for-, for I like that as well. <laughs> yeah. When we're kind of coming up against the hour now, um, does anybody else have any Final comments, questions, suggestions for any of the uh, presenters today. Again, feel free to feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but I just want to thank um, Ashley, Debbie, Vicky, and Sharice for speaking today. It was super interesting, and um, I applaud all the hard work you guys are doing to maintain these local history collections at your branches. Uh, so if there's no other uh, comments. This concludes our program. Thank you for joining us for this month's Next Steps program. Uh, today's program is made possible through HLA members just like you. And once again, please look out for the flyer and registration link to Facts in the Stacks, Considering Book Challenges in Hawaii. That's the next Next Steps program. Thank you, everyone, for joining us Thanks. and have a great Thank rest you. of the day.